Well, praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us again. <clears throat> uh, Brother Ed here from Bethel Baptist Church in Prospect, Connecticut. Going out to do the Ethernet and the Internet. And glad you chose to be with us this time. We're going to sing from the new hymnal 107. Praise the Savior. Praise the Savior. So let's, uh, let's praise the Savior in song. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this great opportunity to handle the Word of God. Help us not to do it deceitfully or twist it to our own doctrines, but may the Word of God reveal to us the truths that you'd have us to know and give us the help and understanding we need to apply these truths in our lives. Thank you for who you are. Thank you, Father, that you've given us the opportunity to believe on you and to receive the gift of eternal life through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And in turn, forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life. Thank you so much for that wonderful gift. Help us to live worthily for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise the Savior. Praise the Savior, ye who know him. Who can tell how much we owe him? Gladly let us surrender to him all we are and have. Jesus is the name that charms us. He for conflict fits and arms us. Nothing moves and nothing harms us. While we trust in Him, trust in Him, ye saints, forever. He is faithful, changing never. Neither force nor God can sever those He loves from Him. Then we shall be where we would be. Then we shall be what we should be. Things that are not now nor could be soon shall be our own it always amazes me how uh, writers of uh, poetry and placed into music just lifts the soul you know it's not like that worldly music at all it's the wonderful uh, music derived from using the word of God uh, for the uh, for the wording. Amen. I mean, I just love it. So here we go. We're going to look at uh, a, an, a, something in the scriptures that God used for an Old Testament prophet so he might see something clearly. And God is always concerned about the people on the earth and what they do with his word, what they do with the Holy Bible. And it's all throughout Scripture. It happened in way back in the garden with Adam and Eve. They refused God's word. They didn't have a Bible, they, but they didn't need one. They, they talked with God every day as they went about doing the things that he had required of them in that garden. And he gave them one command, and of course they disobeyed that command. And this is why I'm doing what I'm doing tonight, preaching the word of God. So we're going to look at uh, something in the scriptures from uh, Jeremiah. If you find the book of Psalms, just keep going towards the New Testament there. A uh, few books past there to find Jeremiah chapter number 18. Jeremiah chapter number 18. So the Lord trying to deal with Israel. Now this, of course, the Old Testament is all about the history of Israel and uh, many, many prophecies concerning Israel. Uh, what would happen when the Savior came into the world, which is recorded in what is known as the New Testament. But the New Testament doesn't begin until Jesus dies. And that's when the New Testament goes into effect. So Jesus' life was lived actually in accordance to Old Testament times. Uh, it's placed in the section we call the New Testament. But again, that promise, that new promise about forgiveness of sins and life everlasting by repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ does not come into effect until the death of Jesus Christ. And now it's in effect. And so you can repent toward God from 
Anything you trusting, anything you're trusting, if you're trusting church membership, if you're trusting baptism, if you're trusting giving, if you're just trusting being a nice person, none of those things are going to work. You're never going to be able to earn salvation. It's a free gift that God offers everyone who will believe his word and trust in him. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And God just wipes the slate clean, and uh, he gives you that gift of eternal life. He makes you his child at that time. Until that moment, you're just a creation of God. And uh, now when we, to get adopted into his family is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, again... God is dealing with Israel. Israel at this time is very rebellious. They're about to go out into captivity. And because of their disobedience to the word of God, they, the religious people were all messed up. They didn't bother doing what God wanted them to do. Things were done sloppily. Things were done haphazardly. Things weren't even done according to the word of God. So God's going to take them out of the land eventually here. And he's going to put them in captivity for a number of years. And then he's not finished with Israel. He's going to bring them back into the land. But God still isn't finished with Israel right now. So the nations need to be careful how they handle Israel's relationship to them. But God says, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. Ever wonder why Germany failed when they started persecuting the Jews? Ever wonder why... Why all the nations that went against the Jewish nation themselves? Listen, I'm not saying the Jewish nation uh, was was really good or perfect or anything like that. But God gave them His word. He chose them, and He's going to keep His promise. God always keeps His promise, and so God didn't make any mistakes in doing so. And He's going to reestablish Israel, and, and He's going to come into the tabernacle. The, the temple in Jerusalem and set up his kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to this earth as he promised. All right, so let's see. Here, here we have Jeremiah in chapter 18. We're going to read the first six verses here. And it says here, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. <laughs> I told you it's all about God's word. God always wants us to obey his words. And here the word of the Lord comes to the prophet Jeremiah, and this is what he said. He said, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. God wants us to hear his words. He doesn't want us to just have a copy of the Bible in our possession. He doesn't want us to carry it around as some kind of good luck charm. He wants us to see what's in it, and obey what's in it for us. And so he says, I'll cause you to hear my words. You know, God causes you to hear his words. He doesn't make you obey his words, but he tells you what will happen if you don't. And that's a good parent. They don't, they don't naturally, normally restrict physically the children from doing uh, something stupid, but they'll explain to them what will happen if they do that stupid thing. And that's good parenting, something you ought to take note of. Then, he says in verse 3, Then I went down, the, uh, Jeremiah went down to the potter's house, and behold, uh, the potter wrought a work on the wheels. The, the pottery wheel was going and spinning, and he's working, uh, the potter uh, working with the clay there, and he's making it into a vessel. And then it says, as that potter was working in verse 4, the vessel that he made of clay was marred, in the hand of the potter. So there was something, some impurity in it, something maybe uh, something too heavy, it wasn't yielding to the potter's uh, skillful hands, and, and it marred the vessel. It probably put a big scar in the side of what was being worked on on that wheel. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, so the word of God, after, he, after Jeremiah saw what this potter was doing, saw what was going on, saw the, the vessel get marred, and he began to work it again, and then the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. He says, O house of Israel, 
cannot I do with you as this potter? So he's comparing the clay to Israel, the nation of Israel. And Israel, as I said, they were disobedient. They, it's, it's like a picture of being marred. And because of that, it had to be reworked. It had to be uh, re rearranged and, and brought into some kind of a, a physical shape, a, a, a form that uh, was going to be useful in the potter's hands and for whoever who might purchase that. So the Lord says, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. And then he, then he lays down something very, very important that everybody ought to pay attention to, especially our governmental uh, representatives and our leaders. He says in verse 7, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation? God is talking here. The Lord's talking here. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I fought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, his words, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So he's, he's putting the warning out there. Just like I told you, God always says, this is the way I want you to live. This is the what I want you to do. This is how I want you to serve me. This is what I'm expecting of you. If you do that, it's going to be all right. If you refuse to do that, Watch out. This is why the church is in such a mess in 2021. And it's been a mess whenever it disobeys the word of God. People often, often ask, well, how come there's so many different denominations? Because everybody's got a different idea of what, what the Bible actually says. But the Bible explains itself. So we're going to look at this uh, account of Jeremiah going down to the potter's house and seeing with his own eyes what happens on that potter's wheel and then God's pronouncement that if it actually that if this nation Israel does, doesn't get its act together he, he's going to he's going to do something he's going to take them away he's going to he's going to tear it down he's going to tear it down and he did because they didn't repent and so there's a warning that you ought to heed from these things I ought to heed myself so we see here that he says that what instant I shall speak concerning a nation. Now, whether that nation is Israel, whether that nation is Russia, whether that nation is China, whether that nation is America, uh, no matter what that nation is, God will work his work in a nation, sending people, believers, into that land and teach them the truths of God's word. And the ones who will believe it will, well, they'll turn out okay. And the ones who don't, well, check your history books. See what happens to nations who go against Israel and go against God. It's a mess. All right, so we, we see four men in the Bible, four men in the scriptures uh, that speak of the potter and the clay. First of all, Isaiah. I say first of all because Isaiah comes before Jeremiah. In Isaiah 64, verse number 8, it says, But now, O Lord... Thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. So the prophet Isaiah was given a vision of God's holiness, and he saw uh, from this vision uh, how sinful the nation was and how they needed to repent, and, and that God is the one trying to establish them and form them into something that God is pleased with, not what man is pleased with. The second one we just read here, uh, and then in Jeremiah. Jeremiah has been called the weeping prophet. Uh, he also penned that short but very mournful book uh, named Lamentations, which comes directly after the book of Jeremiah. And then the prophet Zechariah. 
and chapter number 11, verses 12 and 13, says this, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. Of course, this is in reference to the prophetical, uh, the prophetical thing that uh, Judas did against the Lord Jesus Christ. You can check that out uh, in the Gospels. And then in verse 13 of Zechariah 11, it says, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was praised out of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Zechariah wrote very plainly of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially the events leading up to his crucifixion. Many of the prophecies were, were noted there. This was a prophecy which was fulfilled uh, uh, in Matthew 27, verses 7 and 8, where it says, And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, of whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And so those are the three Old Testament prophets. And then there's the, there's the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, who wrote many of the New Testament uh, letters to the churches and all of his uh, evangelistic journeys and accomplishments and sufferings that he endured for the Lord. Uh, Paul, in Romans chapter 9, verse 21, it's written down, it says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So here he is, he's bringing all these things uh, to a point where we can understand that God means business when uh, he's using this illustration of the potter and the clay. Jeremiah was told by the Lord uh, to go down to the potter's house, which command he willingly obeyed. He, he followed the Lord's uh, will. And there he saw that potter busy at the wheel forming that vessel of clay. And the message from the Lord of Jeremiah concerning the potter and the clay was a, a very timely one for the nation of Israel. And, and it is just as timely for us today. And I want you to see that. The clay, the potter, the wheel, and the making again all have significant spiritual application for each and every one of us. So, again, Jeremiah, it's an account for the Jewish people. But there's application we can use in the Christian life. So I'm, I'm going to speak to you as believers today. Uh, if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, you are, are not God's child, and you're not saved and so this wouldn't be for you. Uh, we would recommend that you do that before the end of your life. The sooner the better. Because you really don't know what you're missing. Now we've got this here. I'm talking to children uh, of God who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Who love the Lord Jesus Christ and are willing to obey God. So we're going we're gonna to take this illustration of the potter, Jeremiah, and God's words, and we're going to apply it to our lives as well, because God is, is trying to get us uh, to be transformed and to grow up into a similarity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the clay, we'll take a look at the clay first. As Jeremiah entered that potter's house there, uh, he saw vessels of clay that were stacked, some were ready for firing, uh, and others were ready for use. Those of you who are familiar with ceramics, uh, you, you understand the firing process and its purpose. And, and it's to make it a useful vessel. The clay, uh, without being properly uh, put to the fire, uh, would not be a useful vessel whatsoever. In the heat, it would, it would just fall apart. In the cold, it would just crack. So... Uh, but he also, Jeremiah also, would have seen clay that was taken from the potter's field. And, and, and he would take that clay and it stored it in a whole different kind of a place over there, just waiting for the skillful touch of the potter to place it on the wheel. And as he turned that wheel, begin to shape it and form it into something useful. And, and then at times, there's found some impurity within the clay. 
and that was when the vessel got marred. There was something in that clay as the uh, potter was forming it with his hands, felt something that wasn't supposed to be there, and he had to dig that out, or, or he had to remove it, and of course that marred the vessel, and he would have to reshape that, reform that, uh, and, and some very, very interesting things we're going to see today. Uh, and the potter has to remove it as he transforms that lump of clay into something that he intended to create. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 21, the Word of God says, If a man therefore purge himself, that means remove the impurities uh, of it from himself, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart, and meet, useful for the master, and prepared unto every good work. So we're all made of the same clay. We're all from the dust of the earth. We're going to turn back to dust again. Uh, we all have impure hearts and sinful natures. Jeremiah 17, verse number 9, says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Talking about everyone's heart. Everyone is prone to sin. It takes a lot of uh, work. It takes a lot of yielding to the Lord uh, to prevent ourselves from, from sinning. And, and sometimes uh, in a moment of weakness, we find ourselves drawn to that, uh, lust in our heart, whatever it may be, and we sin against the Lord. The Lord doesn't want us sinning. He saved us so we didn't have to sin. And so the Bible also says in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, that all includes everybody, even the best person you know. And every one of us are subject to the temptations of the flesh, for there is no temptation uh, given to man that is able to take you that isn't common among everyone. Well, it may vary as far as the intensity. It may vary in, in ways that may not be equal to somebody else, but we're all tempted by pretty much the same things. And you can narrow it down to less than a handful. Now, we have to be uh, realizing that, that 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, uh, well, it tells us that. You can look that at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. But Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. But then it says, and the Lord hath laid on him, speaking of Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All of us, both saved people and unsaved people, whether they're religious or they're saved or not, just uh, we have to give an account to God one day. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. All of us are going to give an account of our life to God. And you know what the key question is going to be? Did you obey my word? It's not going to be how kind you were, if you had nice thoughts, if, if you, uh, you know, paid your bills on time, if you didn't hurt somebody and you had mercy on them. It's not going to be anything like that. It's going to be, did you obey my word? And so this is going to be an interesting judgment. The sameness of nature among mankind requires those of us who have tasted that the Lord is gracious, and I have tasted, he's very, been very gracious to me, and have received of his forgiveness to be understanding of other people. So we, we are understanding that uh, God's not expecting lost people uh, to stop sinning. He's, he's expecting them to get saved. And then working in them and forming them so that they no longer desire to sin. And it's not it's turning away from sin and turning to God. God will help you get over the sin. But you've got to come to him first in repentance, believing that he is able to help you. So, we have to judge with righteous judgment in a very godly humility and godly grace. The grace which tends toward life, not, not the one that, of, of pride and the letter of the law, which tends toward death. And so that's the situation with the clay. 
And now we're going to look at the potter, the one who's doing the shaping and the molding and the forming. The potter in the illustration in the scriptures here, given for our, our learning, is none other than the Lord God, the master designer himself. He says, can I do with you as this potter? <laughs> in other words, I'm the potter, Jeremiah. I'm the potter, Christian. I'm the master, I'm the one with the skill, I can make you into something that is pleasing to me. Here, represented by this industrious potter, fashioning a special work on the wheels is the Lord God Almighty. And this wasn't some chance work without inspiring thought and purpose on the potter's part. He didn't just say, well, I think I'll just make something today. No, he had a plan, it was all planned out. The design was already set in the potter's mind. As his feet began to work the wheels, uh, his hands began to shape the clay as it rises up from the table. And then forming by his touch and that which was conceived in his mind. And it brings us to Ephesians chapter 4, a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. Verses 11 to 13. So, God illustrates that he's that potter, but look what he does for the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13, it says, And he gave some, some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and some evangelists who go out preaching the word of God throughout the world, and some pastors and teachers. And this is the reason for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Those are the three elements that God gave the church, pastors and evangelists, gave, gave men uh, the ability to uh, bring forth the understanding of the word of God. Until uh, we all come, in verse 13, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So God wants us to be conformed uh, to the image of Jesus Christ. He's trying to form us through his word. He's trying to form us through various things that come to us. Even the fire that's used to harden the, the pottery. Uh, he uses uh, fiery trials to bring us uh, into the submission so that he removes all the impurities. Now, the potter's plan is really the best plan for each lump of clay that he's working with. God has a plan for every life. Romans chapter 9 verse 21 says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now, the first part of God's plan is the salvation of the soul. I said that's the first thing. But that's only the beginning for the new vessel. The unfolding of his plan requires the full surrender of our will to the will of God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says that we are God's workmanship. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. You can't save yourself. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. See, so God's plan is that we will, once we uh, come to know the Lord is our Savior, and he puts us into Christ, and then he puts his spirit within his vessel, his new creation, the new creature in Christ. And we're his workmanship so that we would do the things that he has already ordained prior to us getting saved, that we would walk in those truths. We are his handiwork. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Well, what's the darkness? The darkness is sin. The darkness is uh, lost without God, without hope. Uh, but what is light? What is, what is this uh, thing that he's talking about here? 
in his marvelous light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The Bible is the, light, the glorious light of the gospel. These are so valuable for us, but it's just the beginning. And, and God has set forth these truths for us so that we might know uh, how we're to live for him. So what is it to know God? What, what is it for us to have an understanding of, of God? There are so many variables of what people will think about God, but uh, to know the love of the potter's heart, you must humble yourself and kneel before him. And prideful man really doesn't want to do that, so he has to humble himself. To know the work of the potter's hands, you must first see them nail scarred for your sins. That's right. Jesus bore those nail prints in his, in his hands, in his feet, in his side. And those scars are going to be there when we see him in glory as reminders of what the price that was paid. The God of glory gave himself for our sins. To know the will of God, to know the will of the potter's mind, you must have the mind of Christ. And this is to understand the mind of Christ was to do always those things that pleased his father. This is all coming together. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And being found in fashion as a man, this is his, when his incarnation when he came, God manifest in the flesh through the Virgin Mary. He, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. That's the mind of Christ obedient unto death. I fall short of that. I'll admit it. It would have been one thing if Jesus was just a man, just like you or myself, but he was equal with God, and yet, yet he, he was doing this marvelous work in us and that he might make us like unto his own glorious self. <laughs> this is why we're all... It, it's amazing because when we do the right thing we feel good about ourselves and yet when we do the wrong thing whether we know it's wrong or don't know it's wrong something's different in us Not like a darkness but when we when we do the right thing from the heart uh, we know that God is pleased and we're joyful inside it's like the light goes on in us and it's very very good so we have the potter uh, we, we have the clay we have the potter but let's take a look at the wheel, because the wheel is an important part of what is taking place on top of it. Psalm 139. Let's turn there in our Bible. Psalm 139. And we'll pick it up in verse number 1. So go towards the front of the Bible. Not too far. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. It reveals how involved God is in our lives. Now, if you're not saved, God's Spirit is convincing you that God is true. And you have to do a lot to block that out. Sometimes it just takes a regular public school education to knock that out of you. Definitely once you're through college. But God has put it in you by His Spirit, and He's, he's pointing you to the truth. And those of us who are saved... We know that God uses his word to direct our path. So it says here in Psalm 139, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Uh, don't let those King James Bible words fool you, trip you up, because that verse is very understandable. Verse 3 says, Thou compassest to my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. You know, God knows all about you. He knows things about you that you forgot about you. <laughs> Verse 4 says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Verse 5, Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. And verse 6, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? So you see, 
shows you how involved God is with the believer and how he wants him to, wants her to be Come more like Christ's obedience, more like the obedient servant that Jesus was. The wheel pictures for us, I would say, circumstances that come to us in our life. Without the wheel, there would be very little that the potter could actually accomplish. But you have to see that the hands of the master potter, they never leave the clay until the clay is complete. While the Lord's hands are on us in our lives, he's forming us to the fullness of the stature of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You've experienced problems and troubles. You've gone through afflictions and you've suffered in this lifetime, both before you were saved and since you've been saved. It's just common stuff that happens. Getting saved doesn't protect you from dying. We're all going to pass away unless the Lord should come in the clouds and take us all out of here, all the believers out of here. But have you experienced problems to the level that you didn't think you ever would? Have you ever desired to go back to the early days of your youth when you were carefree and just wanted to have fun all the time? Have you gone through trials and tribulations that you didn't think you could bear up under? Then you have to be confident in this one thing. That he, God, which has begun a good work in you, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let that be a memory verse for you. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6. So... We, we see the potter, we see the clay, we see the wheel. Now let's take a look at the making of the pottery vessel again. Jeremiah 18, verse 4. I'll read it again. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. The flaw in the clay was, was found by the potter as he's working it. It wasn't, wasn't found by somebody else. It wasn't found by, you know, Jeremiah. He was watching the potter work his work, but he didn't see it. But he saw what happened when the potter felt it. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, it says, The Lord seeth not as man seeth. Now, you look at somebody... And you wonder if they're a Christian or not. You wonder if they're saved or not. I'm not talking whether they go to church or not. I'm talking about whether they truly are trying to be obedient servants unto the Lord by following his words. And you say to yourself, yeah, that person, I wonder if he's saved. And you, and you, and you try to talk to them and try to understand, you know, are you really uh, 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 trying to serve God and trying to be obedient? And that person might look like, they couldn't possibly be saved. I tell you, sometimes, you know, we look at people and we make judgment calls that we should not make because God knows what go, what's going on in everybody's heart. And we ought to be very cautious and very careful about making these prejudgments called prejudices. And we look at these things and we can say, you know, the Lord... See it not as man see it, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And that's the whole matter. <laughs> the heart is desperately wicked, but God knows our heart. And he knows what we need is his word, and he asks us to obey his word. And if we do, we can expect at the end of our life that we're going to be very happy and joyful when we appear in his presence. God knows all about our heart and he knows what it takes for the heart to be surrendered to him. He knows man is stiff-necked and proud. and they, they want to do their own thing. They don't really care about what God's got to say. Very stiff-necked people. So he's looking for those who will yield themselves to him. God's got a lot of stubborn children. They don't want to comply. 
They don't want to conform. <laughs> and God's not happy with them. He, he saves them. He's not going to cast them away, which I'm going to tell you in a moment here uh, from this illustration. But the Lord looks on the heart. And the Lord knows what it takes for us to surrender, which quite often involves the fires of affliction in our lifetime. That's right. God will use trouble to get us to conform. It takes us a while to learn that. I know I've had to learn it that way a lot of times. Even growing up with my dad, dad had to correct me off a lot of times before I finally uh, told the mark, as he put it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, The trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, think of it as the firing of the clay, think of the trials and the tribulations and afflictions of life, that though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The impurity in the clay resisted the potter's skillful touch. Your impurities do that. God trying to form you into something pleasing in his sight. And he, and, he, and he has to deal with it in me as well. So it's marred in his hands, not in someone else's hands. So he made it again another vessel according to his own good pleasure. Now many times a believer in the Lord, a, a child of God, will complain, why, why is this happening to me, God? Why am I suffering so much? What did I do? Why doesn't God help me? Why, why, why didn't God let something else happen instead that I think I could handle? Romans chapter 9, <coughs> excuse me, Romans chapter 9 verse 20 says, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You have to note something very special here, that the potter doesn't throw that vessel away. He makes it again, that same pile of clay. He just brings it back down into no shape at all, and then he just starts forming it again. And if there's more impurities, he does that all over again. It's in his hands. So he makes it again another vessel from the same lump of clay. And that's how he works in you, and that's how he works in all his children. In the end... It's a pleasant vessel unto the Lord. <laughs> Ephesians 5, verse 27, talks about his church. Talk, not, not, I'm not talking about Bethel Baptist Church, which is the name of a, a place where we gather and we call ourselves Baptists. But in reality, we're just Bible-believing Christians. That's what we are. Christ is our Savior. You can call us by any other name you want, but... Bottom line is we believe the Bible. And this says here that God might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. God is going to do that. He's going to perform that work in his, in his children. And when Christ comes in the clouds and we hear the trumpet sound and the voice of the archangel come up here, we're going to rise up to be with the Lord and he's, we're going to be exactly like him. We're going to be holy beyond our imagination. We're, we're going to be without blemish beyond our understanding. It's going to be marvelous. It's a marvelous time. I hope you don't miss out on it. I hope that, you know, you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and God's still trying to work in you. You know that song, God's still working on me to make me something I ought to be. 
I don't know if you know that one or not. It sounds like I don't know it either. But in the end, uh, are you fully surrendered to the master potter's design and plan for you? I I'm not saying so much what you're doing for a living, but are you obeying what you can from the scriptures? What's directed to you? As you yield to his touch by conforming to his word, he'll make you over again as it pleases him. And in reality, that's what we should be looking for because we have been bought with a price. We're not our own anymore. It's the precious blood of Jesus Christ, God's son. Thank God he rose from the dead bodily and he's alive forevermore. But you haven't seen the last of Jesus. He's coming back. And we will stand before him and everyone will give an account of themselves to him. And there won't be any excuses. As I said, it's all going to come down to, do we have the mind of Christ? Were we obedient servants? Not whether we were perfect and sinless, but certainly did we do our best. Thank you, Father, for blessing us with the truth and showing us what you expect of us. And you leave it up to us to determine whether we're going to follow that directive or leave it alone. We thank you, Father, for your love and grace and mercy. There's no one like you, Lord, the true and the living God. We thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive forevermore and is going to come back for us, He's going to set up his kingdom in Israel in Jerusalem, in the temple, which is yet to be built. And we pray for that temple to be built soon, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, till next time, God bless you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me